Hi, um, let me just start by saying I have a stutter, so uh, I'll try and be as clear as I can. Um, so this talk is called Parlez-vous JavaScript, which is French for do you, un do you understand or do you speak JavaScript? Um, this is a tweet that I sent out about um, two weeks ago. I said, strong typing in JavaScript feels a bit like, e e like, e like eating a burger with a knife and fork, um, which is kind of what I think. And then I got a reply from, from, e from Evil Hacker Dude, <laughs> which is a really, yeah. I don't really understand it, but it's still really, really funny. And it just seems to work because coffee scripts is kind of like that, right? Yeah. So by way of introduction, I work at Twitter, as Thomas said, and we work with JavaScript, not against it. Uh, we, we work, we don't struggle with the language. We use it to the advantages that it actually gives us. And um, the motivation for this talk is summarized in a nice quote from Charles Miller in a blog he wrote in uh, 2004. And it could be applied to anything, actually. But um, I think it suits j JavaScript and other programming languages as well. It says the grain tells you which way the, the wood wants t t to be cut. Um, so this um, talk is like a drama. It's in s stories. It's divided into, into episodes. Episode one is called The Accidental Tourist. Here's the problem. So JavaScript is... <laughs> So JavaScript is, is kind of an, an iceberg, and only a little bit of it is floating above the surface. And it looks really easy, right? You see it for the first time. You come from another language, maybe Java or C++. And the syntax is that C-based syntax. You think, this is easy. This is easier, actually, than what I've done before. Uh, but there's this crazy shit under the surface. and. Um, you need to get to know that. And sooner or later, you'll, you'll try to write in the same way as Java or C++ or something like it, and you'll realize you're fighting it. You're fighting it against the language rather than trying to, to take advantage of what's there. So I was really surprised by this. But um, if you go to github.com and look at the langu languages used for submission, JavaScript is comfortably the most common one, 21%. Uh, so what can we conclude from that? Well, if languages were vacation destinations, JavaScript would be Paris. Maybe not, I mean, yeah, Paris. Paris is, Paris is very, very cool and a great place. It's also a very strange place. So it kind of follows. Um, so since we're tourists and we're going to JavaScript, we need to pack. We, we have a suitcase. We need to pack it for JavaScript. Here's how not to pack the suitcase. So here's your, here's your, here's your tourist. You know, they've been to all these places. And say, hey, yeah, I'm now here, here I am going to JavaScript. This is, this is what they, they shouldn't be packing. Um, strong typing, static this, all the things they're familiar with class or even third class functions, and OOP. So episode two, do as the, the locals do. Um, so JavaScript is, um, there's five, in my opinion, there's five fundamental features on which the language JavaScript is built. Here's, um, here's, here's what we have. Um, first class functions, call and apply, prototypes, dynamic this, and closures. And as I introduce each feature, each um, native JavaScript feature, there'll be a little inset in the corner, which is this, this picture. 
with the city built on the features on the um, the JavaScript fundamentals which that feature inc includes. It sounds complicated, but it's not. Okay, episode three. Uh, OOP not spoken here, which is not actually true. I, I actually lied there because, as you probably know, constructor prototype chaining is OOP. And by constructor prototype chaining, I don't just mean having a prototype which your ins instances are created from, or, or who, who the prototype is a prototype of this instance. I mean when you have one prototype extend a, 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 another prototype. Um, but it's awkward and it's unnatural. And here's an example, here's the old animal thing. And uh, you need to make your um, subclass, so-called, call the superclass constructor. You also need to seed the child object with the prototype of the superclass, which is pretty bad form in many ways because here you're creating another instance. You might not really want to create arbit arbitrary instances. Also, sometimes the constructor expects an argument and it will throw an error if you don't supply that argument. Um, but the alternative is even more difficult. It's cloning the prototype. And um, cloning the prototype basically um, means you're not doing any extension. There's no hi hierarchy. Um, you're actually physically copying all of the code from the superclass to the subclass, and it breaks all sorts of things. It, it, breaks, instance, it breaks instance of, for example. So luckily, in ES5, object create came along, which liberates prototype chaining from constructors. There's no type required. There's no constructor, um, no formal type. And it actually makes prototype a lot more prototype-like uh, because there's no categorization. Uh, categorization is kind of a classical idiom, whilst prototypical idiom is um, simply seeing an instance and saying, hey, I like the features that instance has. I'd like to, to use those. So I think this is, this is, this is definitely um, a step up from constructors. Uh, here's an example of code using object create. <laughs> it's quite nice. I think they made a mistake with the second argument, uh, which is, uh, let me just tell you what's going on here. The first argument is the prototype, the, the animal proto, the thing we're extending. And the second argument is um, the uh, object we want to extend, basically. And they don't just have a simple property hash for the second argument. It's more of um, ES5-style um, object properties hash. So um, it's more complex than it has to be, I feel. So ES6, which is coming out soon, is giving us class. And there's already some frameworks, some, some libraries that have their own versions of class. But it's not easy, and in particular, super is a like a leaky abstraction that uh, framework providers have struggled with for a long time. Uh, here's a couple of examples. Here's one from prototype.js. Requires all users of, prototype of um, the class object in prototype who want to use super to pass super as an argument. And then what happens is prototype itself has to pass your code using a regular expression, a complicated regular expression, look for all instances of super. When it finds and wrap that function in another function, and remove that argument. So it's, it's not very nice. Here's another one from a fairly cool implementation. Austin, he has his class impl implementation, but again, super is not perfect, because in this case, if he didn't do anything, this super would actually uh, refer to uh, superhuman. And um, what we want it to do is um, refer to speak method of superhuman. So again, he has to wrap, he has to look for those things, and he has to wrap the function. So super never sits well with JavaScript, and I believe that's because JavaScript doesn't really, is not a naturally classical language. Um, here's a question. Should we even have cl classes? Um, do you even w w want them? Um, here's another example from the animal c kingdom. On the face of this, this is apparently simple hierarchy. 
not not too much trouble. But hey, the crocodile comes along and says something which I can't say, and then um, he says, "Hey, uh, hey, I walk too. You categorise me as a swimming animal, but I'm also a, a walking animal." And then the duck comes along and says, "I'm all of these things." <laughs> so. Um, this is just one example, and I, I used to love um, the whole OOP thing. I drank the Kool-Aid. I used it for a long time. But I realized I was struggling more and more with these kind of cases, and I was doing it because I thought it was the right thing to do rather than because it was actually helpful. So you have this hierarchy monster, which is it, it comes into play in these, these kind of examples. And it isn't fussy. It devours any kind of... In so no matter how you created your prototypical inheritance, whether it was object create, ES6 classes, con constructors, you've got the same problem. You've got the same hierarchy problem in every case. However, to me, the sad thing is that anyone even cares about inheritance hierarchies because they're not really necessary in JavaScript. Um, and here's why. Because in, in some languages, you can, only call, uh, you can only invoke a function if it's in the hierarchy chain, if it's in your hierarchy chain. In JavaScript, as long as you can see the function, you can call it. You can I I I invoke the function. And JavaScript makes sense of a great example of, uh, of this. So there's two types of JavaScript mixing, or at least two types that I, that I, that I know of. There's the property copy mix in. And that's just an object that you want to mix into your t t target ob object. And there's functions defined. The object defines functions. And you need an extend function to copy the properties from the source function, the, the mix in, to the target. And then you simply extend. So now you can see uh, Crocodile can actually um, have walking and swimming crocodile, and all those functions are there. We didn't have to mess with any hierarchical stuff. Pretty simple. And then there's functional mixins, and the functional mixin is a function. So why should a mixin be an object? Because you never use it as a standalone. It's kind of an abstract thing. The mixin itself is abstract. So it's a process. Think of mixin as a process rather than an object. So here's a mixin function, which looks similar, but it's now a function. And all you do to mix it into your target is simply call that function in the context of the target. Uh, so this is where call and apply, which are two very cool JavaScript uh, features, come, I come into play. So now we're simply calling, um, we, we're extending the crocodile prototype with walking and with, with swing by call. And th it's a good point. I mean, notice that although I'm saying classical inheritance might not fit very, very well in JavaScript, prototypes are still good because prototypes um, are a very efficient way to not have to find the same thing over and over again on every instance. All I'm saying is you can mix stuff into the prototypes. Um, you may have seen something like this, this thing before. Um, so, um, <laughs> how keep patching? Um, this is a great tweet. I, I, really, I really like this. Um, it's not necessarily true, but it, it's Getting there, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of true, and I think um, a lot of people don't like to use monkey patching. They don't like to uh, patch up third-party code because it's seen as, well, uh, you know, it's not for you to t t t to rewrite the code, and then when you upgrade, you have all those kind of issues. And I'm inclined to ag agree, um, but here's a question: How do you patch a third-party library without actually? touching it without updating the code? OK, the answer is to <laughs> wrap it. So you can wrap the function. And wrap is a function provided by several third-party libraries like underscore and prototype. Or it's easy to write your own. Here's an example. So underscore has an each function. And generally, when you call it, uh, it just returns undefined, so it iterates, it does what you want, it calls the function on, on, every, on, on every element, but it returns undefined. 
But say that's not very useful. Say you want the array or the original collection to be returned. Well, here we can use the wrap function to say, and wrap basically takes two arguments, the function you want to extend or the function you want to patch and the function you want to call it. And the function you want to call it takes the original function as the first argument. So you can see each is the first argument here. And then all we have to do is, I don't know if the mouse, yeah, there we go, is, um, is call the original function and after that return the, the collection. And now you can see we're calling each and instead of undefined we get the collection there. So we did all that without having to mess with the underscore. But anyway, why would you use underscore still when there's, when there's ES5 shim, which is another kind of patching, uh, uh, which is another kind of monkey patching, which I think is very safe and very sensible because it's a standard. And if you're, um, if you're polyfilling to a standard, then you can't go wrong because most p p browsers are impl implementing it now. And once the other ones do, it's obsolete. So it becomes automatically obsolete without you having to do anything. And a good uh, shim like ES5 shim will check for existing implementations first, so it won't automatically throw its own implementations. Um, and without something like ES5, without applying a standard or instead using underscore, we're kind of holding ourselves hostage to the inadequacies of other browsers. So just because IE7 or IE8 are not ES5 compliant, we're not using all these great functions like like by each and object keys. We're using a third party library, uh, which is non-standard, it has underscore in front of everything. And sooner or later, all those browsers will become ES5 compliant, but you're still stuck with underscore. So uh, I think ES5 shim is a, is, a, is a great thing, and I think you should do it. And soon ES6 will be out, and there's already an ES6 shim, actually. So um, you might be interested to look at that. So episode six is f functional. So JavaScript has first class functions, which basically means you can pass the function as an argument, um, you can return the function, things like that. Um, so high order functions we kind of touched on before. So um, let's say we want to create an array. Uh, we have an array to start with, which is names of fruits where they've got space characters. Um, space characters after some of them, so we want to trim that, that, those spaces and return an array with the characters trimmed. So the obvious approach is a f f for loop, and that's absolutely f f fine, but it gets kind of tiring writing the same structure every single time. So as of ES5, um, the, there's a map function, so we can do exactly the same thing with just fruit map, and that says, the map says, give me a function, I'm going to apply that to every element. So his um, function is something which is going to trim the elements here. Which is nice, but it's still kind of untidy because you've got to have a function with a function keyword every single time. And just scanning that, it's not, well, it's fairly obvious, but not, not completely. Um, so here's a globalized function, and what this function it does is return a new function which invokes the given method name on the <laughs> runtime argument, wherever argument is returned at uh, runtime. So for trim, for example, obj would be a string, so whatever string is provided, it would just invoke trim on top of it. So then we can go from the map function to, some <laughs> to something like that. So again, it just makes it more succinct still. And if you're doing lots of these, these, kind of these kind of iterations, it's a good thing. Now, you should be careful. Don't use this just all the time because there's extra function calls. Like for every iteration, there's now two function calls. So, so the map function is doing function call and globalize is doing another function call on top of that. Function calls these days are not that expensive, but if there's lots of um, items to iterate, you should be careful and you probably, you probably um, shouldn't, shouldn't optimized to this extent. Another functional feature is something called currying. Well, I call it currying. currying. A lot of people in the JavaScript community do. Strictly, s someone in Haskell or a strict functional language will say that's not currying. Currying is actually something that creates a function that can be called as a chain of functions with a single argument. But I think it's a reasonable convention in the JavaScript community to call this thing currying. Other people call it partial application. 
Let's look at an example. So here's a very simple add function. Simply takes two arguments, x and y, and returns the sum of the arguments. Now we can carry that function, which means create a new function called add7. So we can pass 7 as an argument to carry. Now we have a new function called add7, which means every time you call add7 on the argument, it will add 7 to the argument. And what that actually does is to wrap the add function in the curry function and put a hard-coded 7 in there. So then when we call add 7 on 5, it passes the 5 argument along, takes the 7 which is already in the curry, adds the two together, and there you've got 12. It's a very simple thing, actually. And if you want to see, I won't dwell on this, but if you want to look at the slides later, this is an implementation. This is how you could impl implement curry. Some of the JavaScript uh, frameworks have also got their own I I implementations too. Another nice um, functional thing you can do in, d in JavaScript is function composition. And what that does is basically, say you have two functions, it says invoke the first one and pass its result as an argument to the second one. So for example, I can create a new function which is called uh, alert power which finds the power of the argument and then um, um, and then hurts it. So it's basically passing the result of math power as an argument to a, to a hurt. And again, here's the implementation of Compose, in case you're interested. We can put those two things together, carrying and composition together, and get some very powerful code out of that. So here's something which uh, you've all seen the parseInt. We well, can make a parse alpha function pretty easily through this. And what this is doing is um, the first bit is saying uh, curry slice with argument zero, which means use slice and always start from the first from the first uh, from the zero index. And then it's composing that with search. So it's basically saying whatever the results of search are, pass that as a second argument to slice. So now you will always be slicing whatever is past an argument between index zero and the index of result of the search. So if we pass a regular expression as a search, then we can make a nice pass alpha function which will, which will um, slice between zero and the first non-alpha character. So we can use that on an email to get everything before the at. Uh, this is not a great example because you could have a punctuation mark in, in the bit in front of the app, but I couldn't think of any, of any other example right now. So That is functional. So <laughs> you've possibly seen this before. So episode seven, beware of imitations. So I live in San Francisco. San Francisco is great and everything. But did you know its fire hydrants are actually, are actually non-standard? So if there was a catastrophic fire in San Francisco and every other fire department in California had to come, they would be totally screwed <laughs> um, because their fire hydrants would not, their hoses would not fit onto the fire hydrants. In a similar vein, jQuery is really great at everything, but its objects are non-standard. And this is something you should be careful of. Uh, so for instance, for instance, jQuery selectors return jQuery objects. And so here's, um, an, here's a, a, an object called anchors, and it just basically gets all of the anchors in the page. Uh, but is it an array? Well, we ask it, it's actually not an array. But it's kind of an array, which makes it even worse because it implements some of arrays functions like push, but it doesn't implement for each. So now you're stuck with this hybrid kind of object, which you don't know what you can do with it and what you can't. So you don't want to call any standard ES5 uh, utilities on it because you don't know if they're going to work. So you're stuck, with, you're stuck in, in jQuery land. So instead of calling the ES5 map, you have to call jQuery map which is totally non-standard. The arguments are the wrong, the wrong way around. Like ES5, you'd pass the element as the first argument. jQuery, you have to pass the index as the first argument. And that's pretty bad. Um, and you're kind of stuck there, because then hrefs is also a jQuery ob 
uh, uh, two. So this is something to, to watch for. Um, there are ways out of it. For instance, you can use the, the S5 standard map and you can call um, you can call it in the context of anchors and that then um, that then uh, calls it as though it's a regular, I regular ES5. And now the elements are the right way around. It's the arguments are the right way around, so you can pass element as the first argument. Or you can simply do the same as you might do with arguments uh, to make it an array, pass anchors as a first argument. So, um, oh, by the way, I think there's also a, a query method uh, to do the same thing. So, episode eight, everyday harvest script. Um, so, you could do this. Um, this is a method to get an event target from a callback. And because of IE, like the differences between IE implementations and non-IE IE implementations, the event, you have to like sometimes get it in, 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 in different ways, ways. And the um, source element, like in, um, in non-IE, it's target, which is standard, or source element for IE. And so this is one way to do it, and it's a lot of if statements, and if you're coming from another language, you might do something like this. Um, but you could do it a lot more succinctly. That's exactly the same thing. And this takes advantage of the fact that in, in JavaScript, the, the, the logical and and logical or don't have to take booleans as their arguments. They'll simply take anything and uh, if evaluate it, and it's a tr tr truthy, evaluates to a, a truthy result, then it'll it'll carry on to the next step. Um, so I think, um, like, as I did JavaScript, the longer I did JavaScript, the more I did more succinct expressions l like this. Not everyone l l likes this. I know experienced JavaScript developers who think this is too succinct. Personally, I don't understand why, but I am just want to say that. So um, in case you slept through all of that, uh, there's only one thing to take home, and that is from the excellent, uh, this, here's a quote from the excellent eloqu eloquent JavaScript book, which I fully recommend to everyone. And it says, basically, every language has its own way, follow its form, don't try to program as if you're using a, 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 another language. And that's pretty much it. The slides are up here, um, or they will be up any minute now when I just do whatever. No, actually, they're not up. Forget it. <laughs> they will be up soon. And so, um, anyone have any questions? Tim, 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 Tim. The questioner. Uh, you used your uh, globalized uh, function there. Uh, is there a reason we didn't use bind? Because that basically does exactly the same thing, doesn't it? Or is there like maybe is there? Um, a, yeah. How would you use it with something like tr tr trim though? So you just say um, uh, trim. Oh, I don't know. How would no, it wouldn't. Because I think I tried that way first. Because it, you've got to t turn it around. Because something like trim, the context is actually the string. So you'd have to. Pre-bind it with Oh, the actually, context. no, I've got one for you. Uh, there's a component for it. Uh, oh, there's a component for it, folks. <laughs> I'm, I'm not joking. <laughs> I'm sure there is. But yeah, um, you, you wouldn't be able to use bind there because you'd have to know up front what string you wanted to b bind it to. The whole point is the string is passed as the argument. Um, you can try it. I don't think it would work because the, the point is you need to call trim in the context of the string up there. Trim in the context of the string and you've preset the context now to an empty string. So it would only trim an empty string every time. Did you have a question? question. Any more questions for Angus? Yeah. yeah. Um, real quickly, um, Watching your slides, uh, especially your example of uh, was it um, parse string? Was it sorry parse 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 alpha? Um, 
I, I was reminded, I think, with the Brian Kerninghen quote where he says, debugging is twice as difficult as writing code, and so if you're as clever as possible when you write the code, by, defini so, uh, by definition, you're not smart enough to debug. And that's what I thought about when you saw that. So do you have any thoughts on striking the balance of, uh, I mean, it was really, really, I couldn't understand it y at a glance okay. at all. Yeah. It reminded me of Python, you know, just keep it simple, mm -hmm. line by line. Any thoughts on that? Thanks. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree you can get too cl clever. But the thing is, there's a lot of frameworks out there. People use jQuery and stuff without knowing how the code works, right? You simply need to know, I can use this thing. If I, if I have a case where, like, I need, to, I need to iterate something, and every time I need to run it in the context of this argument. And once you get into that pattern, once you understand it, you figure out what to do. I, I'm totally like, I, I get the point. You, you definitely got to be careful. But if you have a library and you have globalized function there, I totally wouldn't expect people to understand the implementation of it. So, yeah. yeah. More questions for Angus? I think that was it. <laughs> you were stealing the show in the end again, as usual. Big hands for Angus Kraw from Twitter. <laughs> <laughs>